everybody as you join us, everyone joining us from all around the world today for our 42 Courses speaker event. Today we are so pleased to be joined by Patrick Collister, somewhat a legend in advertising, even though he may well deny it himself. He's worked for many years in the advertising world at many of the top companies that you will be familiar with, uh, most recently Google, and is now creative director of AdLib Digital. And I'm sure in that period of time has seen huge changes in the way that advertising operates. Patrick Collister, you're very welcome to join us here in the 42 Courses Speaker event. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, I think a couple of things. In one of your flyers, um, I was billed as being the uh, head of design at Google. I wish. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was head of design for a team called The Zoo, which is Google's creative think tank. But... Um, it wasn't really actually I'm going to start a little story here um when I did join Google um I discovered that before me uh, there had been a, a head of design um and she had left the company which is why the trade press thought that I was her replacement uh, which I wasn't the amazing thing about her and why she left the company was that Google engineers <laughs> were looking at the color blue. So if you go into the Google search engine, you'll notice that all of the titles are in a blue uh, typeface. And being Google, they started experimenting with them to see if there were any differences. And, and blimey, one of these blues led to uh, a $30 million a day difference in transactions. Uh, and so they said to the head of design, look at this, this Panto cut, isn't this amazing? She said, yeah, that's amazing, but we're using that one. And they said, no, no, you don't understand. This one has a $30 million a day difference. She said, well, I'm using that one. And shortly afterwards, she left the company. So um, <laughs> there you go. It's a great story to start us off with. And as I said, Patrick, Patrick, I'm sure you've seen many, many changes over the years. And I want to read something back to you, which you may not remember saying, the quoting Patrick. Patrick, say, <laughs> Patrick says, there's no point putting a piece of shit in front of somebody because they'll recognize it as shit. And if they recognize they're being remarketed shit, it becomes double shit and then they really, really get angry. And I mean, we're often talking about the value of advertising from how it used to be for TV and now this move into digital and just sort of patching it in to make it fit in. And I think you've got quite strong feelings about that, Patrick. I do, I'm afraid. Um, I mean, I do find it fascinating whenever I go to a marketing or advertising conference and I, I start frothing at the giblets, I ask people how many of them have got ad blockers installed and at least 50% of people do. In other words, in our own industry, we recognize that we are the problem. In our own industry, we recognize that advertising, you know, to a greater extent is complete crap. And so we're opting out of it ourselves. Um, and I find this absolutely amazing. And of course, the reason for this is the way technology has grabbed hold of advertising uh, and um, made vast fortunes out of it. So, I mean, loosely speaking, it's called programmatic. And um, so, you know, the delivery of advertising to uh, an identified target audience in a nanosecond, you know, the bidding and then the placement of that is just staggering how it happens. You know, but what it's led to is is people thinking that targeting uh, is what advertising is all about, except they're not even bloody targeting. And this is the bit that really gets me. When I work, worked at Google, only 3% of digital ads, and we're talking about 2018 now, so maybe things have changed, but I would argue only marginally, only 3% of digital ads are actually targeted, uh, personalised in any degree at all. 97% of it is just spray and pray. 
And under those circumstances, if you're a brand manager, you can buy a billion media impressions for diddly squat. So why bother with the creative? It's still going to work to some extent or another. I mean, my analogy is with direct mail. I mean, cast your mind back 20, 30 years ago and all of the stuff that landed on your welcome mat. Um, you know, when um, direct marketers punched air because they'd managed a 2% response rate, uh, I mean, I was asking them, what about the other 98% who actually found your mailing offensive, you know, to one degree or another? Um, what about them? Oh, it doesn't matter. The 2% justifies everything. Well, now you look at digital and actually the average click-through rate on Google, uh, the Google Display Network, is 0.02%. So we're now talking about 99.98% of people being in receipt of stuff they don't want. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Well, yeah I and mean, yet, you know, I'm saying just 20 years ago, Seth Godin wrote that book, um, uh permission marketing you know and he anticipated a time in which advertising would be anticipated would be relevant you know would be uh personalized and and so people would uh relish it instead of which advertising has now become crass uh it's become invasive and it's become just annoying we spoke um when we met earlier in the week Patrick about can and how we thought maybe how things had maybe changed recently um, and when we're talking about digital obviously we're covering so many things online ads search marketing but let's talk about the importance of mobile let's talk about can advertising and then this whole thing that just doesn't seem to be talked about and which I know you've touched on that of course we see so much on a smaller screen now whatever percentage of amount of information is seen on a phone screen talk about that a little bit Patrick well God, honestly I do find the whole mobile thing um challenging because uh actually I buck the trend I still look at things on a laptop and on a desktop but I mean, my own uh, business, I mean, the Capels Awards, for example, I mean, 70% uh, of all our website views are on mobile devices of one sort or another. So, um, so that's how people consume. And of course, you know, TikTok is uh, absolutely descriptive of that because now that's the shape and size uh, of, of videos. That's the way people like to create them and like to consume them. And of course, you know, the mobile phone is this astonishing thing, you know, because it's not just a receiver. You're not just receiving entertainment, you're creating it as well. I mean, can about six or seven years ago, uh, Will I Am was one of the speakers. He'd been invited there by Samsung. Um, and I found him just really entrancing, actually, as a creative person. Um, but he was talking about the fact that the Black Eyed Peas had just recorded an album and the record company uh, was wondering how to advertise it. And so they briefed an agency and there'd been scripts and it was all rubbish and everyone was arguing and all the rest of it. Anyway, they were in the studio recording this album and the executives had been talking about it. So Will I Am pulled out his mobile phone. Uh, he spent half an hour shooting some stuff. He edited it on his mobile phone <laughs> and then he just posted it onto YouTube and it had had three million views 48 hours later. You know, so just and that's the thing about it. It is it, a lot of people forget that it's also um, not just a, a reception device. It's a transmitter as well. Mm. And of course, that's what's changing advertising so totally influencers you know people you can believe because it's like the girl next door Zoella, or it's it's somebody whose life is is one similar to you know so so much advertising money is flooding into influencers because we're accessing them uh, and feel we have a relationship with every day through this amazing little mm. device you've got your best friend in your pocket and of course being answerable to your consumers is massive change instantly responsive 
your work goes out, work that used to take months to create is created more quickly, put out and responded to immediately? Well, there are some uh, catastrophes there. I mean, uh, brands call it joining the conversation. And I wrote a piece for New Digital Age, ugh, I don't know, I think it was last week, really, about brands joining the conversation about the Queen's death. And you go, I mean, you know, ecotricity. I mean, what role, what voice do they have in a conversation about this? I mean, what they did was to dress the Queen in, um, uh, they support a, a football team and they dressed the Queen in their football shirts. And I mean, do you know, it's just tacky. And, um, and so it didn't take very long for people in social media to say, shut the fuck up. <laughs> and um, excuse my rude word, but people in social media are a damn sight ruder than I, I am. And rightly so. I mean, I do find it amazing. I mean, you know, we were talking about can as well. I mean, how there's so much purpose driven uh, advertising now winning awards, but, but one of the really dangerous areas for uh, brands to go is uh, BLM, is to do with, you know, uh, black lives, black lives matter and support for them because it's really tricky, really tricky that there is an oppressed minority and brands think that they can join a conversation about it. They can't. They really, really can't. And when L'Oreal, after the murder of uh, George Floyd, uh, tweeted solidarity with our black, you know, friends and black community, you know, an explosion of rage. Now, you tell a story that I really enjoy, Patrick, and I'll just remind you about it. <laughs> and it's along the lines of when you're talking about um, search, which I think often search is maybe belittled a little bit these days because we think, oh, you don't have to think. All you have to do is tap it into search. But you tell a very nice story, which is how when people started putting in the search box, you know, uh, how I feel sad or how should I feel or how I should that. a man feel that then this was recognized and reacted to by certain brands in creating solutions would you tell us a little bit about that Patrick yeah that honestly when I was uh, at Google um, some of the guys in my team uh, and girls in my team uh, were looking at search data and and uh, people began searching for answers to emotional questions and um, and they're really insightful. So, for example, um, one search question that was asked 61 million times uh, in one particular year was, uh, what's it like to be rich? And um, and so the zoo team in Paris actually took hold of that. And they thought they would answer it. And um, so for the El Jumeirah group of hotels, there's the El Burj Hotel, the one that looks like a, a sail. Uh, they created a 3D experience of that. So again, using Google technology, you could go into the hotel and explore it in minute detail, all the way through to the little Hermeth um, knickknacks you have beside the beds. I have to say, you know, it is breathtakingly tasteless for a seven star hotel. I mean, <laughs> just, but, but answering that question, what's it like to be rich? And I've got to tell you, you come out the other side thinking, well, blimey, I don't know if I'd live it like that. But, but also, I mean, um, uh, the team worked with uh, Unilever, um, where Axe Links were looking for a new positioning because. Axe, the, the spray, was for teenage boys. And it was basically the proposition was spray and get laid. Um, as if, you know, my son, when he was a teenager, used to come tottering out of his bedroom, just reeking <laughs> of Axe. And I was trying to say, listen, this could not have the result you desire, my friend. But, but anyway, it was... Um, uh, Google analysts who noticed that guys were going online and they were searching for things like, well, is it okay for a guy to wear pink? You know, is it okay for a guy to eat, you know, yogurt for God's sake? Is it okay? Uh, and then from that insight, Unilever were able to 
start talking to young men about self-identity. Of course, it's okay to wear pink. Of course, it's okay to le- like other men. Of course, do you know? And from that, uh, positioning uh, acts links uh, then changed their advertising. That was all about be the person you want to be. And so, I mean, uh, there's an absolutely amazing book. Uh, I'm just looking at my bookshelf here. I'm coming back. I promise you. Where's <laughs> Um, uh, 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 uh. Don't go yet, Patrick. We've uh, so much I'm more not, to ask oh, you. No, I'm looking at, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh yeah, here we go. There's a fantastic book by Seth De- uh, Seth Stevens Davidovitz called "Everybody Lies," and he was a um, a Google analyst and an engineer, uh, and he took a look at. Um, what people really think and do because their search behavior reveals all of that. Um, and so it was really, really fascinating. Um, so all of his researchers are, I suppose, about five years old now. But after the Boston Marathon bombing, um, there was a massive surge um, in anti uh, Muslim feeling across America. And uh, to such an extent that President Obama. Uh, gave a state of the nation address to say, look, you know, what we have to do is to calm down. And um, and during the talk, uh, what Seth noticed is that uh, hate terms, racist, anti-Muslim spiked. In other words, as Obama was talking, people got madder and madder and madder and more and more until there was this one moment when at the very end of it said, and you have to remember that some of our best loved sportsmen and uh, many of our military are Muslims as well. Boom. Suddenly people are going online and they're saying to Google, okay, uh, Muslim sportsmen. And they discover Mike Tyson uh, is a Muslim. They discover that Shaq O'Neal was a Muslim. And they find that really interesting. So Seth O'Neill then wrote to the White House saying, look, you know, this is really good stuff, but what you need to do is to be more specific, mention names, you know, talk about how uh, uh, these people are absolutely part of the weft and warp of American life. And it has an effect, so. And I think you mentioned earlier the uh, fantastic stories there. Uh, Thank you, Patrick. You mentioned earlier the uh, phrase programmatic advertising. And of course, as you said, People genuinely hate advertising, but I think you give the caveat that people genuinely hate advertising unless it's relevant. So let's let's just talk about that, unless it's salient to them personally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is that people, pe- all people will tell you they hate advertising. Um, and uh, in the advertising industry, we've taken that to heart. The truth is that People don't hate advertising, they just hate bad advertising. And most advertising they're confronted with is bad advertising. And I mean by that, it's it's charmless, it's thoughtless. Um, uh, I mean, you know, if we go all the way back to the 80s when um, I was a young copywriter, my boss at the time was a guy called John Webster, who was a, an advertising genius, actually. Six of his ideas are still running today, even though God, John, God bless him, is dead. But John said, look, if you're going to make your way into people's sitting rooms uh, un, uninvited, it behoves you to be charming, to be polite, to be nice. Uh, and I think that still holds good today in the digital space as well. So for me, I talk about the word creative. What does it mean? Well, actually, it means being interesting. It's no more than that. If something is interesting, I'll go, ooh. Mm -hmm. And that is often because it's personal to me. And that's the thing about digital media. I I can target people by their interests. If I know you're into, um, uh, if I know you're into, say, modern art, for example, and I'm a Pepsi brand launching a new uh, water, it's going to be premium priced. And um, I've decided that my target audience is a metropolitan art market. This is really fascinating, you know, because now I can talk to people about art, you know, and they'll go, oh, that's interesting. Um, and so, uh, yeah. But of course, 
I mean, th this is the ideal, isn't it? This programmatic advertising, but at the same time, it's problematic, isn't it? You know, we're sending out signals, but at the same time, if too many responses to my signals become too personal, then it's just creepy. <laughs> and where, mm -hmm. where is this balance for advertisers today, whereby they want to personalize the message, but at the same time, they don't want their target market saying, oh God, that person's tracking me. Yeah, well, we're going to have to wait and see what happens. But um, uh, Google is what they call deprecating third, the cookie. In other words, um, third party data. But I mean, the fascinating thing about that is I don't think it's going to make any difference. You know, what people like Google say is that um, first party data means that I have to uh, give you data about myself willingly and I understand what the compact now is between the two of us and as a result of that they believe that creativity will make a comeback and I'm going well I don't think so because most of us are now getting accustomed to every time you click onto a website you know they ask you uh, to click on a little button saying that you accept cookies so from that moment on if you know what I mean you've sold your soul to the devil <laughs> and um so, you know, the point is, is that there is just so much media now with so much space that there's just so much bloody advertising. You can't escape it. And I mean, this is the problem. I'm such a problem that actually even the big platforms themselves know it. So, I mean, you know, you can subscribe to YouTube Red. And the thing about that is YouTube without the bloody adverts. And I mean, honestly, it does drive me nuts. Have you noticed now? that YouTube is putting on two ads at the beginning of a video. You want to watch a video about, I don't know, you know, training Labradors. And I've got to put up with two bloody videos submitted to me that I, because I'm in advertising marketing and things, I get all of this stuff about grammar, you know, Grammarly. I, <laughs> I, you know, I actually can spell and punctuate, unlike a lot of copywriters. He said, waspishly. <laughs> <laughs> as you say, the, the premium option these days is, as you say, to have YouTube and to opt for no adverts. It means the Spotify premium is without adverts, and yet they've managed to avoid that in the way that you'll listen to a, when it's embedded in a program. We still are exposed to adverts, even if we're paying premium and always trying to escape the adverts. Yeah. Um, and again, you touched on that word again, creativity. You know, when we're in these circles of people, it always rises, simmers. And I think, as you said to me when we were chatting earlier, that nobody had asked, what does creativity actually mean? So let's, let's get down to the bones of this subject that seems to be the buzzword of everybody. And yet we never sort of take that step back to say, what, what are we actually talking about? What does it mean to us? And, you know, how relevant is it still to us today? Yeah. Well, I think creativity is a, a word like snow. In other <laughs> words, what I really mean by that is the Eskimos have 26 different words for snow. Uh, we have one. And it's the same with creativity. We talk about creativity meaning a multitude of things, but we only have this one word for it. And uh, so, I mean, I can say to you, hey, Louise, I've got a really great idea. You know, next time I'm in Dublin, let's go out, you know, to um, uh, O'Burn's Bar and get completely trolled. And I say, that's an idea. You know, I've had a, but then on the other, on the other hand, I've been working today on uh, advertising ideas for a, a particular brand. Uh, and I'm looking for an, a platform idea from which multi-channel communicate. How are those the same thing? Well, they're not. Uh, of course they're not. Um, but for me, it, it all comes back, I suppose, to simple definitions. We're the only creature on this planet that is creative because be, 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 we've got <laughs> these. We can make stuff. The word create means to make stuff and in advertising we do we make ads 
You know, I sometimes think that people forget this in agencies. They think the job is to make a document or to make a meeting and lay the pencils out. It's not. It's actually to create materials that will elicit some kind of response, you know, from customers, consumers out there. You know, so essentially we are making stuff. And that's what creative uh, creativity is. It's about making things that ultimately make the world a little better. I'm not talking about brand purpose here. I'm, I'm saying about literally make things better. You know, I make a wheel because it makes transportation of, you know, lumps of wood or whatever easier. You know, I make uh, a piece of communication about a better mousetrap because I want to share that with people and I want to be able to give more people employment in order to be able to grow an economy and, you know, so forth. So, so as I say, for me, creativity is about uh, making stuff that makes the world uh, slightly better each time. Uh, and in the context of advertising and digital advertising, it's about being interesting. That's no more than that. Oh, that's interesting. I'll take a look at that. And you so, mentioned uh, there, yeah. sorry, Patrick, you, you mentioned there um, the book uh, by uh, Seth uh, Stevens Davidovitz, The Everybody yeah. Lies. And I, we love it when people start talking about the books that either they've enjoyed or that they think are still influential or maybe somebody new they've discovered. So, I mean, what, what's, what are the types of books that you... Oh really either play a role in your thinking or you've just discovered uh i think probably the most important business book i ever read uh and which influenced me deeply was the empty raincoat by charles handy um uh, charles handy was a shell marketing executive who was very very bad at it but became uh, a business analyst i suppose um but the other thing about him um is that he he understood how people worked and so uh, um i've always i've always been a great admirer of his i mean what am i oh well i've just been reading schutzpah and schutzpah the story of sachi and sachi oh, and right. um, uh the hubris of all of that i mean i do remember it vividly you know i, I can remember after uh, they bid for the Midland Bank, Saatchi shares went into freefall and they hired a, a new CEO, a man called Louis, uh, uh, Robert Louis Dreyfus, uh, to come in as CEO. His guy had been running Adidas. So, I mean, he had form and the share price had plummeted from over uh, 1100 to, I think it was about 340. Uh, and I invested all the money I'd got at the time in Saatchi shares at 340 and then watched as they continued to plummet. And by the time I sold my 10 grand's worth, I got 200 quid back for them. And um, it was really interesting at that time because uh, uh, the Saatchi brothers uh, uh, got involved. A guy called in, in Chicago called David Hero ran a pension fund uh, and he started cutting up ugly about Saatchi's performance. And as a major shareholder, started demanding changes. And um, he was told more or less to sod off. Um, and this became a big thing, actually. And I remember being rung up by, um, I think it was uh, one of the BBC business programmes. And they asked me, you know, what do you think about this Chicago guy, 26 year old, as if that was important, by the way, David Herrick getting involved and, you know, stirring things up with Saatchi. And I can remember that at the time saying and thinking, as I still do, any guy like Maurice Saatchi who can devalue his company, you know, from a shareholder value of 1100, you know, uh, 11 pounds a share to under 20p really, really deserves what's coming his way. And, um, Anyway, that's the story. I don't think it was an answer to your question. But I, mean, <laughs> I, mean, you know, I think it was. Books. It was the, 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 the story about the Saatchi brothers. <laughs> well, no, that's right. And here we've got, what have I got? I've got um, uh, Rory's book, Alchemy, which is, uh, you great know. Great fans of, we're great fans of that book in 42 Courses, Alchemy oh, by Rory this, Sutherland. Um, I don't know. You see, I mean, you know, uh, this is fascinating. Um, 
I'm reading this at the moment. And so uh, okay, it's sorry, uh, who's that by Patrick? It, this is the hit makers by Derek Thompson. OK, and, tell us um, about that then, Patrick. Well, what what's so marvelous about it? This book, he talks about the fact that we like familiar surprise. So, I mean, there was a great book about uh, art written 25 years ago called The Shock of the New. And when something is very, very new, it is disturbing. And by and large, we hate it. You know, so Shostakovich gets um, uh, booed at his own the, at the Rites of Spring. And Picasso also gets mauled critically before we all go, well, she is quite good after all. He talks about the fact that actually the big hits are things that uh, a, a new twist on stuff we're comfortable with. And I found that really interesting. So, I mean, he talks about ABBA a bit, you know, that one of the reasons ABBA is so successful is that we're familiar with their melodies from Mozart, you know, the way they classically create. But I was looking at advertising, so I mean, I was looking at this year's Cannes Award winners, and I think that's so right. The Grand Prix, the Titanium Award at Cannes this year, was won by the UK agency Engine, with a brilliant um, idea, uh, recreating a young footballer who was uh, knifed to death uh, in South London, aged 15. And he was an apprentice with Crystal Palace. So he had a career in front of him as a Premier League footballer and everything that in, entails, except of course it never happened. And his father, who is this whirlwind of energy and drive and passion, you know, finally managed to get uh, FIFA through engine to get uh, FIFA uh, to create him as a player in the game FIFA 21. So Kyan uh, Prince, you know, uh, came back to life as a player and from that it became a platform for donations. Or Now the thing about that, it's a great idea, but last year we saw Burger King uh, inserting their way into FIFA 21 also by sponsoring Stevenage. And the year before that, we saw Wendy Bur uh, the hamburger chain inserting themselves into Fortnite, into a Fortnite battle. Mm -hmm. So we're familiar with brands doing interesting things in the gaming space. They come along and they do it with, uh, with, with Brio. And so, and so I look at, I was looking at Cannes this year because I think the signposts to the future are never among the golds. They're always among uh, the bronzes even if they get that far or, or they're shortlisted. And, uh, and I think that's true this year too, by the way. I mean, I think, I really do think the metaverse is turning into a thing, but um, all, of the, all of the ads that won awards around the metaverse in Cannes this year were uh, spoofs taking the piss. So Heineken, you can have a, a pint in the metaverse, a meta pint, you know, uh, Budweiser are trying to get us to buy uh, buy horses or uh, to race in some kind of metaverse equivalent of the Kentucky Derby. You know, all of that is complete bollocks. But then, hidden away in the weeds, I found this amazing <laughs> idea from a company uh, in Australia who uh, were forced to create an alternative reality for the Melbourne uh, Open Tennis because uh, Melbourne went into lockdown, second lockdown, there were no spectators. And they had this genius idea of selling tiny little digital patches of the tennis court. And if the ball landed on that in any match, then uh, you as the owner of it, you know, had content unlocked, but it also created the whole arena as a, a virtual little uh, 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 meta arena. Uh, and for me, I can see more and more brands doing stuff like that in the future. I think we touched on that a little bit when we were talking earlier in the week. And I'm interested now you saying, you know, looking down into maybe the bronze winners, because I think we were quite in agreement that we weren't so sure that those gold winners this year were really all that. <laughs> I know. Well... I mean, in some ways, can uh, can lions should be flattered because uh, the advertising marketing community around the world sees it as being this annual uh, intellectual explosion, if you like, that we're going to go to the south of France and we're going to see things that are 
But of course, it ain't like that. You know, mold breaking work only happens every now and then. I mean, uh, you can talk about epoch making campaign, but they're, they are few and far between. Mm. So I'm completely with you, Louise. I mean, you know, I, I, there was, there's been work in the past that has just blown my mind. Mm. And I haven't had, I haven't had anything blow my mind for, you know, three or four years. And I really, I, I honestly, I mean, I know there's a whole load of PR about this, but I think it's horseshit. I think <laughs> during COVID, uh, creativity took a real tumble and in fact there's research evidence um, in the UK to show that uh, advertising creatives were more depressed than uh, general and it's really difficult to you know create advertising that's bright and sparkly when a you think you're going to lose your job secondly the people around you are ill you know and thirdly you're locked into an airless room for six weeks. I do want to bring in uh, some of the people who've joined us uh, to hear your wise words, Patrick. And hardly, if, my, if my colleague Elisa has a question, I'd love to bring her in. So if any of you do have questions for Patrick, please do put please, them in the please. chat at the side and I'll bring you on. Um, but just before we move off that particular subject of, of can and of advertising, and I mean, obviously, you know, this is your world, Patrick. Um, just not to leave by the fact that we were talking about the fact that so many of the winners were charities or causes and this feeling that brands need to, we've already mentioned it earlier, but brands need to put themselves over as having this sense of purpose. Or would you like to yeah. just uh, <laughs> well, spout a few words of wisdom on that, please? <laughs> oh, they aren't words of wisdom. They really aren't, Louise. They're just, oh, you know opinions and but one of the things I did at can is um, you can enter a, a campaign multiple times which means that you can m win multiple awards with it so uh, I looked at the winningest work as our American friends would say uh, at can this year and found it really fascinating uh, of the 10 most lauded campaigns uh, only one had a uh, clear commercial purpose and actually only one was what you might call an ad, but you know, TV video based. Uh, it happened to be nine minutes long actually. Uh, and it was a film from Apple. Um, and what I loved about it was that uh, it's definitely the continuation of a series of ads. The first one they had was kind of called Back to the Office. And this one was called Back to the Office. You know, and in three months, it had got 34 million views because it was beautifully written. It was charming. But it's everything that the guys at System One, Orlando Wood, who wrote that uh, those two books, Lemon and Watch Out, are talking about as classic brand advertising. Mm -hmm. There are personalities, there are characters. We recognize them. We follow them. You know, we feel for them. And in all of the Apple advertising, you see the product being used. You see you know, demonstrations and um, and the whole, that's what the ad is. It's written around product stories and not just that one ad, by the way. I noticed that there were four different um, commercials called Shot on an iPhone, one of them uh, made in China, which is just delightful. It's called um, uh, oh God, The Return. And it's the story of a kid who's a stunt double uh, he gets injured and so he goes home for Chinese New Year to his remote village where his dad gets him to shoot a film on iPhone about the village. And so all of this is shot on an iPhone of a boy shot on I Do you know, I mean, this is a classic advertising idea, but it's just wonderful. And for me, the really fascinating thing about this is that this is the only brand advertising made, uh, I can see it can, you know, that... Uh, uh, that is consistent, and yet it's being applied by the number one tech brand in the world, Apple. You know, Samsung are doing all of this clever stuff with technology, and they're doing NFTs, and Bridges will talk to you if you're uh, thinking about committing suicide, and in Australia, they've got headbands that measure the um, uh, the impact to rugby league play. All of this is really clever stuff. Apple aren't doing any of that bollocks. Here's some advertising. And by the way, it's brilliantly written and it's brilliantly produced. 
and it's fantastically effective. And I, I, you know, I find that so interesting because, you know, again, going back to Cannes and the IPA, you know, Peter Field and Les Burnett, the authors of uh, The Long and the Short of It, have been talking about this crisis in creativity. And what they're saying is that increasingly uh, brand managers have been walking away from long-term brand building and have been uh, spending all of their money on lower funnel brand uh, activation, what we used to call direct marketing. And they say, this is a real problem. Um, and it is a real problem. On the other hand, what they haven't noticed is that all of that brand building work may not be in brand building advertising any longer, but it is going back through into uh, other engagements and specifically to influencers. I mean, I was shattered to see in North America alone last year, influencers were paid $5 billion for their contributions to marketing. Well, I'm going to bring Ewan in in a minute because he's got a great question. But just before we move over to Ewan, um, just as you were talking about that theme of the adverts, I wondered, did you remember the uh, Penny advert? Is it a German supermarket? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that one really struck me almost with its simplicity and you felt like it had the potential to run on almost forever with this this family that you got it sort of reminded me of was it the old Nescafe advert so you had the the running sort of uh relationship the trouble is, I, I understand Louise it was just bloody miserable wasn't it it was miserable Christ. It, did, it was miserable but you felt like oh I can get to know this family that's why I've touched on it in the way that you feel it had the potential for, for the story to be developed. No, it was, uh, again, it was only, it was one of only two uh, traditional TV. Very content. traditional, yeah, which is actually why it caught my eye. <laughs> yeah, that, absolutely, and Apple was the other one. Um, but again, I mean, what um, Penny Marked were doing there was supporting a charity. So it yeah. was all about the end of COVID. Um, mm. For me, I much prefer the orbit approach, the chewing gum approach, which was, I don't know if you've seen it, but they did this two minute commercial where people emerge from lockdown and they start kissing each other and it becomes <laughs> this massive kiss-a-thon. <laughs> so again, there's a brand promise in it, but it was funny and it was yeah. charming and it yeah. was, you know, yeah. Whereas, you know, God, German gloom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, you did, did say to us your concern about the lack of humor. Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> OK, well, let's let's bring uh, Ewan in because he's got a great question for us. So, uh, Ewan, we'll just put you uh, on the spotlight there. I don't know if Elisa's managed. Oh, super. Well done. It's great to have help here. Ewan, do join us with your question for Patrick. Thank you. I'd have worn a shirt and shaved if I knew that I'd be spotlit. <laughs> um, I uh, thank you. I come to 42 courses thinking I'll dip in and have something quick and then there's a big thunderbolt comes in at some point and the one that came from what you've just been talking about Patrick is the idea of big ideas and how you you say you have not, not really seen one in the last three four years and one of the challenges I've got is you when you see a big idea you can think you know it's a big idea but then quite often what you think you've created is a big idea you have this fear that comes in that makes you think it might not be a big idea and sometimes that fear is enough to not put it out there or you do put it out there and you realize it's not a big idea, it doesn't land. So I was really interested in the campaigns that you've been uh, behind and part of where you've had a big idea land, or if you work with colleagues who regularly land big ideas, what's the secret sauce? Uh, are they coming up with hundreds of crap ideas that they just keep hidden uh, just to show us the good ones? Um, is it a quantity game or have they got a process that's helping them land more bigger ideas? Great, thanks, Ewan. Uh, well, back in the day, when I, I worked at an agency called BMP, Bose Massimi Pollock, and uh, they morphed into DDB. And so there, the entire ethos was about finding great ideas uh, and campaignable ideas. So big meant campaignable. So I was talking about my boss, John Webster. You know, and he was just bloody brilliant at it, especially bears. So Hofmeister bear he created, you know, that ran for years. They brought it back last year. But honey monster he created, 
John Smith's No Nonsense. So these are big ideas because, as I said, they were platform ideas, but he also had the skill to execute them brilliantly each time. And so they acquired momentum. And But I think, you know, I mean, I think, um, I think there's been a sea change in marketing. You know, if you were the CMO of a big company um, five years ago, you spent uh, a lot of your time with your lead agency talking about the big idea. And then it was kind of, um, uh, I hate to use the word trickle down because it's kind of rather perjured thanks to Liz Truss at the moment, but it was kind of about trickle down communications. You had your big uh, 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 brand campaign and then that trickled down through. But then I think what happened is that um, coming out of the financial crisis, CMOs have been increasingly beaten up by CFOs. And so they've been spending more and more and more money down at the bottom of the funnel in order to be able to report sales figures. You know, that's the trouble with brand building, big idea brand building. You don't have immediate figures there over a period of time. And it's very difficult to allocate a number to an ad that ran 18 months ago, for example. So, so that's what's happening, increasingly short term um, expectations. And then marketers have discovered that actually, if you have a whole flock of little ideas, that tends to be more successful for two reasons. One, because they're little ideas, if they crash and burn, no one notices, especially your bosses, by the way, you know, because they're still old enough not to be able to understand how technology works. But the other thing about it is, uh, going back to the whole programmatic thing through digital, you're still getting sales results, measurable results measurable you know within days by the way and so you're able to uh, uh do a string of uh numeral um reporting and that's what it's about it's numbers 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 and so that's why i think we see the big idea under attack um thanks so much it's, it confirms what i feared but um i think all of us are in a position to escape it if we can keep a long picture the idea of a big platform that can support a thousand flowers is lovely and something that i can work with from today Thank yeah you. it absolutely and the other thing is i mean choose your clients i mean one of the interesting things is apple is the the most powerful brand in the world today but it also had one of the most evil brand managers in steve jobs you know and as my ex-boss david ogilvy once said that you know in no town or city did I ever see a statue erected to a committee. And that's the trouble with most, uh, most clients. You're, you're selling work to a committee. Steve Jobs was the man. He had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with um, uh, Lee Clow, uh, and he drove it single-handed. And, you know, you look at Virgin, one man, one brand that stands for things, you know, the moment you start dealing with a room full of people, you're in trouble. Thank Thanks you so, so much, much for the contribution. Thanks, Ewan, for your great question. Thank you very much. And um, so we're getting close to wrapping up time. Um, I am going to bring in my colleague, Elisa. elisa has got a rather philosophical question that she'd like to put to you. So if you'd like to join us, Elisa. Oh, I'd love to. Patrick, it's been such a pleasure hearing all your stories and hearing your invaluable insights. What I was thinking of and uh, what I um, seem to come across from this talk is, do you think the problem is that a lot of brands try to be all things to all people, jump on every social movement, and it backfires in a way? Because, as you said, nobody ever erected a statue to a committee. Uh... Well, I don't think it's all brands. I mean, we're just talking about, like all of these things, you know, you have a whole spread. There are a number of uh, brands out there who um, seem to have intelligent marketers. And then there are a whole load of brands where, I mean, I listened to a marketing director the other day who was proud of the fact they had never had any marketing training. And you're going, God almighty. And I'm also one of the UK's biggest marketing driven companies uh i'm not going to mention it by name but um i heard the ceo re refer to their marketers as the coloring in department so i mean 
you know, there is enormous disrespect in business for marketing and for advertising because there's been just rank laziness and stupidity for the last 15, 20 years. Um, Eight million people in the UK claim to have done um, marketing training of some sort or another. So that's eight million adults who all think they know um, what marketing is. And um, and I have to say that of the eight million, I think probably 7.9 million haven't a bloody clue. Um, uh, it's horrible when something is in danger of becoming a vague and amorphous term without any real meaning attached to it. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I mean, I have to say that, I mean, if there are any marketers in this call, I think marketing is a um, absolutely fascinating discipline because it is left brain, right brain. You need to be both. Marketing has become a, a science thanks to data. But on the other hand, really successful marketing is still an art. You know, you, you still need to uh, have an insight about what it is that your customers are looking for in order to be able to meet that need. And then on top of that, you need to be able to then uh, present it to them in a way uh, that they find enticing. And that's, you know, the advertising is probably the last part of, you know, that creative um, uh, process. Uh, and there are a handful of marketers out there who are really fantastic. But I do sometimes kind of feel it's a bit like advertising. Some of the best people in advertising are no longer in advertising. They got, you know, expensive because they were good. And so they got chucked out. And it's the same in marketing. There are some absolutely brilliant marketers out there who, um, who are too opinionated. So my friend Sean Gogarty, for example, giving him a plug. He's an absolutely brilliant creative marketer, as well as uh, having the most forensically analytical brain I've ever come, come across. And of course, um, uh, he's currently a consultant, A, because he can probably earn more money from it. And secondly, because actually people like him, large companies find too hot to handle. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I mean, you know, because you're locking horns with the CEO the whole time. It's mm. about company direction and ambition. Which, again, I'm just going off on one here is um, <laughs> often why marketers do make very good CEOs. I think the last time I checked, 11 FTSE 100 companies had uh, marketers as the uh, CEO, as the CEO. So Alan Jope, who um, is the CEO of Unilever, he was a marketer, um, and I think that shows actually in you know in um, in where he's taken the company and his uh, determination that uh, Unilever will be a purpose-driven company with purpose-driven brands, and he doesn't mean that in a greenwashing kind of context. He means that those businesses will become more successful because they mean something uh, valid to people. Thanks so much. Thank you, Eliza. Um, so, so thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick, for joining us, uh, for sharing your wisdom on this Thursday afternoon. Thank you to all of the 42 course members who took the time to join us on this call and for the lively chat that's been going on in the sidebar. I think we'll collect together the wisdom of Patrick and we could probably publish a book there now of all his wise sayings. It's been a pleasure really to spend the afternoon with you, Patrick. Thank you for joining us. You can find Patrick in our 42 courses. Uh, digital marketing course if you haven't already completed it there it's highly recommended so it just remains for me to say thank you Patrick Collister for joining us I hope that you've enjoyed chatting with me today god I don't know I, I, I sounded a bit like a tap that's been <laughs> loosened <laughs> but, but thank you well, I'm glad that I'm glad that you vented it in our company so that we can all uh, learn from you and uh, hope that you'll join us again. Hope all of you will join us again uh, for another week of wisdom from our 42 course guest speakers. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Bye. Great.